Hello, and thank you for joining us on Scottish Business Week. I'm Danny Gallagher from Business Gateway. With me today is Poonam Gupta of PG Paper. Poonam is a leading UK entrepreneur and CEO of one of Scotland's most successful export businesses. This uh, global success story started life from your kitchen table almost 20 years ago with only a thousand pounds. Now, I hope I haven't given away too much of the backstory. Um, the business has gone from strength to strength over the years, and you're now one of the, the most recognized entrepreneurs in the UK and beyond. So the company now has a turnover of in excess of 60 million, which is incredible, operates in 60 countries. Uh, offices in India and the US, China, Sweden, Turkey, and still growing. So an incredible story with a career-long interest in strengthening and enabling greater collaboration between Scotland and India. You've also led a successful Scottish Chambers Task Force to India in 2019. And You've been recognized as one of the 100 most influential in the UK-India relations and are currently chair of the UK-India Manufacturing Council, the FICCI, the largest and oldest apex business organization in India. Poonam, do you ever sleep? That is the question. <laughs> so thanks for joining us on Scottish Business Week and great to meet you. So we all want to know the ins and outs of you and your business, because we know as Business Gateway, uh, many businesses are always keen to hear what other business owners are up to. Um, it makes them think about their own business uh, and some of the ideas they can implement. So we'd just love to hear how you got to where you are today. We're going to start with a couple of serious questions, um, which I, I don't think we probably should cover, just to get your thoughts initially. It's a challenging uh, time for startup businesses at the best of times, but in the current economic climate, even more so. So let's talk about what made you start. Thank you, Danny, and thank you for a very nice introduction. Um, I, I am actually born and brought up in India. So I did most of my life, I did my schooling, my university uh, in India. And I came from a very conservative family. When I say conservative, there was a set pattern that women were supposed to follow in India, which is fair enough, get educated up to maximum graduation and then get married and look after your home, your husband and your children. And somehow, maybe just growing up, noticing the society around me, I didn't want to follow the same stereotype. I wanted more from life. And having married my husband, who was a, who is born and brought up here, a, born in Ireland, and then he's based in Scotland since the age of seven, I came to Scotland in 2002. Uh, I arrived in Greenock, the west of Scotland, so from very sunny, Delhi to very sunny west of Scotland. And when I came over, unfortunately, I was almost immediately presented with a set of personal challenges, um, which made me go back to India. And then I came back again after a month. So I couldn't like settle. It wasn't like that I came and I just settled straight away here. And whatever personal stuff I was dealing with kind of left me, you know, in a very uh, not a very good emotional state of mind mentally. I was very disturbed. And I realized that, you know, the only way perhaps to overcome whatever I was going through was connecting with the wider world and, you know, getting out. I didn't know anybody when I came here. So I started looking for a job. And have, I am a graduate in economics from one of the finest institutes in India. And then, then I did my MBA in international business and marketing. And despite that, I couldn't find a job. So then, you know, rather than wasting time, I tried looking for voluntary uh, roles in any organizations, perhaps where they didn't have to pay me just to connect with people. That was the idea at that time. And I got lucky. 
I got a job with a chartered accountancy firm in Greenock in their tax department where I worked for two months. But what that did for me was I heard all these, you know, things about VAT and taxation and personal allowance, a lot of things which kind of made me thinking I started. I could kind of connect the dots and work out perhaps a little bit about the business landscape in Scotland or the regulations, the requirements. Having finished that, I actually went in and with the help of a friend and my husband, I started a locum agency where I was placing pharmacists in the NHS. And that business was doing very well, which I think if I remember correctly, I must have started in November, November 2022. But my heart was always in international business. That's what I wanted to do. I was always curious about other cultures. I was fascinated with the idea of traveling even as a child. So I started exploring at the time the trends and somehow everybody was talking about recycling at the time. I don't remember 20 years ago. If you remember that you know, there was lots of talk about waste and recycling and how are we going to tackle this waste? And I started my research in that area. That took me 10 months, 10 months. I was researching, making a lot of cold calls and you can almost say expanding my knowledge base and understanding what was going on. And then I realized that there was possibly a potential where I could take products from Europe and USA and export them to India. You know, my obvious connection with India was there. And I realized that a lot of manufacturers in Europe and USA were sending a lot of stuff into landfill. And only if I could convince them that rather than sending your products into landfill or burning them, can I please have them and I'll repurpose them or I'll find use of them in another market, which is not, you know, your market, not your major market. So, you know, your product kind of doesn't compete with your own market. And that took me around 10 months. And that's when, you know, I finally managed to convince a company in Italy to sell me a couple of containers. I think the deal was, I can't remember now, but maybe 27, 28,000 euros at the time, the money that I didn't have. During this time of my research, I was already aware of Business Gateway. So I was taking help from them. I was telling them I want to start a business and they generously helped me write a business plan and gave me 1,000 pounds, which helped me buy my initial computer equipment and a nice table which I very well set, you know, in the basement of my then house where I used to operate from. And once I convinced the Italians, I, I didn't have the money to pay for this deal. So I had to do some financial engineering, you know, with the customers I was already speaking to in last 10 months to find a way where they could pay me first and then I could pay for the goods. So I basically created a value proposition which allowed me to raise the money that I needed to pay for these goods. And I kind of took it from there and that's how my business was born. So cash flow is king, basically. Cash flow is always king. So PG Paper has experienced phenomenal success. That's brilliant news. What do you think has contributed to that success? Consistency and hard work. If I, if I was to put it into a, it was, it's never easy to start something. That's the hardest part, actually. Once you start on that journey, you set goals and you set that ambition and you try and, you know, find that strategy to how you are going to reach there. If I'd be honest, the first couple of years were simply hard work. Lots of good contracts that I delivered. You know, I promised whatever I delivered, I had promised, which allowed me to gain and earn more contracts. Basically, the first couple of years, it was organic growth. I'd say just simple result of hard work, dedication, delivering on good contracts, delivering on promises that I was giving supplier and customers. But thereafter, it was very obvious that, you know, to grow the business, I would need proper planning strategy in place and perhaps money. You know, till then I was just rotating the money the same way I had done my first deal. And I think it was just making sure that I set first the target made sure how, you know, in the, the back office that I had, you know, I started slowly recruiting people at that time are going to cope, you know, with that target, having my systems in place to make sure that, you know, anybody could basically work with me to make sure all my documentation ex in export 
documentation is very important even till the, today so you know simple people can churn out complex documentation so i always made sure my system supported the ambition and the people were brought in to understand the whole uh, goals that we were and how are we going to achieve that so vision was always set clear and i think all of those factors contributed to the continuous growth of pg paper so i guess experience comes with significant decisions along the way i'm wondering what lessons you have learned along the way to get to where you are now oh my goodness the list of lessons is really long it is really long in last 20 years we we have seen so much you know if i just pick on like the recession you know the financial crisis we saw in 2008 2009 then in recent times you know there has been brexit then there has been covid and you know now energy crisis every every problem teaches you something every problem so the list of lessons learned are very wrong very long but the main lesson which has been learned is whenever you are faced with a problem focus on finding the solution not the problem you know if when we focus on the problem itself you know we can get really worked up and we can't think you know, if you get there because we are very stressed and stressed, as I read in various places, cuts out the blood supply to your brain. So what is important under challenging times is finding a way to keep your calm. And once you can get hold of yourself, you can get hold of a problem of the problem and find the solution for it. And I think if I were to sum, I was to summarize, this is the biggest lesson among many others that I have learned in last 19 years. So you touched on sustainability uh, earlier on. And so what kind of products do you, we're going to go on and talk just briefly about sustainability, but what products is it that you manufacture? And, you know, in terms of, you know, PG paper is, is just a name, but, but what, what are, are the tangible assets? When you get your Amazon box delivered at home, that box is made of the cardboard. You know, we... You know, we are supplying packaging solutions to the industry. When you buy, a, if I, I'm trying to simplify this, you know, the toilet paper you use every day, which became a talking point when COVID actually initially came in. And, you know, we were at that time, we were supplying essential supplies, you know, uh, because there was shortage of toilet paper. When we talk about pharmaceutical industry, you know, the leaflets that you see in the boxes or the labels that you saw, see on your boxes, that's label paper. We have a huge portfolio of products. Um, paper is used in industries that you might not, a normal person might not be even aware of. For example, even when you're building an aircraft, certain types of papers are used for flooring and insulation. So we, we have a really wide portfolio of products and recently you know with this change in the mindset of not using single use plastic i mean again we were way ahead you know before even this change arrived we were we are constantly innovating we were looking at these coffee cups and as i'd sit and look at them i'm a paper woman you know i have to analyze everything i see and i was like this cannot be recycled uh, because, you know, when you like, if you remember previously, there used to be plastic cups and then there came cups that you see in Costa and Starbucks, they have a plastic lining inside. So most of it can be recycled, but not all of it can be recycled. And then there was limited ability to recycle. So it, when I talk about sustainability in PG paper, we've always kind of stayed way ahead of this changing curve to work out what products the industry might need in the future. And we work with a lot of manufacturers around the world to kind of innovate and test those products and then take them into the market. So, for example, about eight years ago, there was this plastic packaging in India. And we knew that, you know, this packaging is not good for the environment. We went to a manufacturer in Japan and completely came out with a new product with that, which then now almost wholly replaces that packaging in India. And then, you know, the competition followed follow this as well. So I think sustainability is kind of almost ingrained in the very business model of PG paper and everything else that I do out with. And just thinking about other businesses then, I mean, what can they do to, to help sustainability and is it viable going forward for them? 
the way the industry is innovating right now, these products, some of them may not be highly viable at the moment. But, you know, when you look at consumer products like cups, like, you know, your takeaway boxes that you get when you, you know, uh, from the restaurants, actually, we all can do our bit. Um, these products on the grand scale of things in numbers actually at very small cost. You know, to the overall cost of the product. So actually, if the consumer demands and says, I want, I don't, I will not take the takeaway in plastic boxes. Why are you not using biodegradable packaging, which is now widely, widely available and you can see them in various restaurants in Glasgow itself. And, you know, the businesses themselves commit to this purpose, which they are. I'm seeing more and more businesses focusing on this whole sustainability, net zero piece and, you know, environmental friendly products. I think that change will come. And as you know, the change will come in volumes and numbers as the volumes become bigger. The economies of scale will make these products more affordable. And in five or six years time, we might turn around and say, as if, you know, this is the way life ran. And why should that, why should it have been any different before that? When you mentioned um, Amazon and deliveries, obviously that market, you know, it went skyrocketed during lockdown uh, and during COVID. So, so for you to keep up with that, how, do, how did you find that in terms of the challenge? Every challenge is actually an opportunity. If you think about it, even every problem, like I said before, teaches you something. So we have an office in China and, you know, we were keeping a close eye back in 2019, you know, 21, yeah, 19 in China to figure out what was going on when things weren't very clear and having a very close relationship with Far East, you know, countries like Japan, South Korea, we were kind of keeping in the know and it was only obvious that it was inevitable this time that, you know, these lockdowns are going to go worldwide for example. And when you know your shops are closed, uh, in the first three months, if you remember, there wasn't even any online. I don't think there were many deliveries online because, you know, everything was practically shut, you know, except, you know, supermarkets and essential supplies. You weren't buying garments and things like that. So at that time, tissue paper for some reason became the biggest challenge. And, you know, we adapted very quickly. We have the expertise in import and export. It was a case of finding out supplies and making sure we brought, brought them in faster to ensure that, you know, we could supply to wherever they were needed. COVID actually brought so many challenges, so many challenges, and there we are still facing them. Uh, challenges in terms of disruption of supply chain. We are overly dependent. Most countries are overly dependent for basic supplies from country like China and China was in a lockdown and that's why there was shortage of materials. There were shortage of consumer products. There were, there was even like there were, if you remember, there was time that people were saying food will run out. And it's just about recognizing in a situation, if this is what's happening and you know, this is how, you know, things supply chain is going to be disrupted. What all is going to be short in supplies and working. I mean, we couldn't do it all and we didn't want to do it all because at that time, our team was also under a lot of pressure, emotional pressure, mental pressure, the fear of COVID. And it was very important that we supported them mentally. I mean, I've been in the business for 19 years. If I sat doing nothing for six months, could we afford it? We could absolutely afford it. At that time, the major focus became how do we keep our people safe? How do we keep them mentally sane and connected? You know, how do we keep that, give them that assurance that they will have jobs because people were getting laid off. And even though furlough was a scheme announced by the government, still people were losing their jobs. And then, you know, bringing our team together and then making sure that we created a small group of people who were helping bringing the essential supplies from various other countries, not just China. And that's where the 19 years of experience came in handy. And the relationships with 60 countries came in handy. I could call somebody in India and say, I, will, I need these, these, these products and you need to ship them fast. I could call somebody in Turkey. I could call somebody in Egypt. You know, I had so many more kind of supplies dotted that I didn't have to depend upon that single point supply from China, which kind of helped to help, you know, these supplies which had to go into the market.
Yeah, so that's uh, I mean, basically you just had to adapt to the situation. So, um, yeah, challenging with COVID uh, and obviously uh, the current economic crisis. I'm hoping that that will resolve itself quite quickly. So on a more positive side, give us an insight then. How can you foster a culture of innovation within a business as you've done? Fostering the culture of innovation. I think the most important people, what is the most important factor in a business? I think it's the people. The most important factor in any business is the people who run it. I'm not, you know, a company who's running on robots. I have people. And as far as, you know, I can bring these people along. And, you know, they we have a shared vision. I have a very big thing in PG, which is, you know, we have shared values, shared vision. We like to connect with each other. I am very open to new ideas. In fact, I encourage new ideas, not just in products as such, but also in processes. I would like to think that I like my team to understand the place they are in and take responsibility for their work. And often they are independent to making their own decisions as considered fit in a situation. And that all comes with that support and confidence we instill in them. You know, that we make them feel safe, that, you know, they are in a safe environment where they are heard and, you know, their work will be appreciated. And all of these mix of a shared vision, shared responsibility at making, and also maybe lead by example. You know, they see me and they see that I'm so passionate about business. I'm also working on many other projects at any given time. I'm there to support them when they need them. I have an open door policy. I know some articles now say you should never have an open door policy. We should have dedicated time. But you know, as much as I have multiple businesses, I still have quite a lean team that I can support. On top of that, you know, my team is supported by, you know, um, several managers and those managers are empowered in knowledge, in making decisions and, you know, again, feeling that safety that and wanting to give their best to the company. And, and if that doesn't work out, they know that, you know, they have sitting over them somebody who has 19 years of experience and they can tap into that experience when they're stuck. So I'll always encourage, for example, if somebody comes with a problem, I'll say to them, okay, you've told me the problem. What do you think is the solution? And then I'll sit down with them and work it out. And I might not agree with everything they're saying, but then I'll enhance it. So they own that solution. And I think all of these things are so important, you know, in building a business and in growing that business and making sure that people feel valued. And, you know, I feel like I'm taking them with me and all of that automatically, you know, creates this culture of innovation where people are excited. They want to come to work. They know I'm open to ideas. They know I'm working on multiple projects at any given time. And when we sit down, they want to share those ideas. And I think this whole, fortunately, that culture that we've created, we've learned from our mistakes and had to make a lot of changes. But I think where we are today, we are in a good place where you know, people come up themselves and say, okay, can we do this like this? Or maybe this is not working. Can we look at it this way? Can we look at this system? And we are listening. It's quite refreshing to hear you say that one of your greatest assets are your employees. So that, that that's really good for businesses just to remember that, that, you know, you can't do everything yourself, that, you know, you do need support. So I guess, you know, what you're saying there is that you're pretty much inspiring the next generation of entrepreneurs. We know the public sector has got, you know, a number of programs to nurture, support and motivate. But sometimes I feel that the best people that do motivate our future entrepreneurs are the guys that are business owners themselves. What about your own team? Are there any entrepreneurs on there that you think will go on and do something? Well, I'll tell you something. Over the years, I have obviously had employees and also some of them have moved on. And some of my employees that I know have a chain of saloons. One of my first employee in the company was actually my neighbor, very bright guy and full of ideas. And now he runs three saloons. You know, his passion was hairdressing and he runs three saloons in West of Scotland. And I feel really proud. And he's always thinking about importing, exporting, 
once in a while would ask for my opinion of what I think. Then there was another employee and she now has a series of shops. You know where she's selling consumer products here. I have had several employees who've come out of PG paper and gone into other roles, but also businesses. Personally, I feel you were absolutely right when you said. It is the entrepreneurs or business people who can motivate the next generation. People often look for examples. People often look for leadership. People often want to connect. You know, sometimes it's not about if you want to do something, it's about how that piece, you know, how do I do it? Especially if you don't come from a business background or you might not have a lot of money uh, in your pocket to start the business, which I, for example, I didn't have. And when, when people connect with real life stories, you know, there is that feeling that comes inside. If they can do it, I can do it. I mean, even today, I meet a lot of business people, a lot of inspirational leaders, and I find those little qualities in them, which inspire me as well to do bigger and better than I'm doing today. This, uh, um, this business and ventures and going into various things is not always a chase for money. It's never a chase for money, in fact. What it is, is wanting to challenge yourself to see what can you achieve next. I have often found you do something well, the money follows. And that's why the chase is never for money. It's about challenging yourself. It's about developing yourself, whether it's in the space of mental well-being, whether it's in the space of learning how to control your emotions, whether it's a space, it's in the space of learning some Excel worksheets, some basic stuff, whether it is learning a new, uh, how to implement a new ERP system. It's about, I often say um, that, you know, it's not about competing with others. You got to be a better version of yourself. I want to wake up. I mean, it's unrealistic to think that I'll wake up every single day, you know, and think, oh, I'm better than yesterday. Sometimes I'm just older than yesterday, you know? I know how you feel. Or sometimes I'm just more stupid than yesterday. But it's about setting up those short term and long term goals which we want to achieve. So when I started my entrepreneurial journey, it was very lonely. I was in a new country. I didn't know anybody here. I had to learn everything practically by myself. I did get help, thankfully, to some really good organizations like Business Gateway and eventually Scottish Enterprise, which helped me fill in the gaps in my learning. I also basically worked on, try to do courses, short-term courses, which will help me, you know, fill in those knowledge gaps. But actually on the whole, it was still quite a lonely journey. I didn't know, you know, any entrepreneurs here. I didn't have a sitting network. I didn't know much about the Chamber of Commerce at that time, for example, now I know. So I believe that as a business owner, I kind of take it now very personally that I must help people. You know, that people don't need to go through this journey feeling lonely. They don't need to be alone. That, you know, there is a cohort or, you know, a group of individuals which should be able to reach out to each other. That's why I'm a big believer in mentoring. And I'm very proud that I was many years ago, I was part of this, you know, initial founders of this women business mentoring program, which was started by a chamber of commerce at that time. I have mentored children as young as seven, eight years old to, you know, people who are 50, 60 year old. I don't care. Entrepreneurship is not about just the young people. It's not just about the youth. It is about often you might find when people lose job, it is actually people who, the, who are in the senior bracket, even if they have a lot of experience, suddenly they are made redundant. And that might be a decision coming from the fact that the company thinks, oh, we are paying them too much. We can hire somebody at a lower salary who is younger and more energetic. What happens to these people? You know, they have dedicated 20 years of their life working in a corporation. Why can't they, you know, take their life savings that they have built and start a new business? Surely they can. And why should they not be deserving of the same help that, you know, a person of 20 or 23 year old is deserving of? In fact, it's often harder for the older you know, age group to learn and to adapt and to get that help. So that's why I'm a big, big believer in mentorship and helping each other and connecting with whether it's entrepreneurial Scotland, whether it's Chamber of Commerce, whether the fact that I'm an ambassador of Women Enterprise Scotland, 
I'm an ambassador of Young Enterprise Scotland, or I am, for example, the chair of PICI UK India Manufacturing Council. The idea of almost every role that you find me in is something to do is helping connecting people in some way or the other so they can feel supported. It's all about supported, whether it's on local level, national level or international level. So we've kind of gone full circle. I don't know where you get the hours in the day to do all these kind of things, but you're hugely inspiring. And it was great to hear your insights today. So, so many thanks for joining us. Poonam Gupta is the CEO of PG Paper, and I hope you enjoyed the chat. That's it from me, and bye for now.